Cheshire City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. And for those who don't know, T Tanya here is from Pat Bangkok Bataya Hospital. She arranged this talk. Dr. Ian, amongst his other claims to fame, works for them. And he's going to... There'll be a dramatic pause while he walks up the stairs. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Doctor. Well, thank you very much. Now hold the microphone closer to this one. Yes. <laughs> Do you want it on this or are you going to hold it? We've, we've got a glass of water. Can everybody hear me? Well, welcome to you all. And I'll start with a bit of a quiz. I've been here many years, 23 I think, full time as a Patia resident. And what am I? Wren has asked me to talk more about myself and less about my racing cars. But <laughs> I don't think so. So what am I? What is my nationality? Had a few thoughts? Both, both wrong, wrong, yes, I was actually born in Northern Ireland. <laughs> my father didn't know what to do with my mum <laughs> and uh, he rang the local doctors find out what he's supposed to do because mother was going into labor and the answer was what foot do you dig with and father didn't understand this so he tried another doctor who also said what foot do you dig with and having worked out that he didn't know what foot he was supposed to dig with he put my mother on the bar of a bicycle and pedaled her to the local hospital. The local hospital was, had been the workhouse. So, well look, interesting cars. <laughs> so I was, can safely say, does he do this with every speaker? <laughs> yeah. So I can say that I was born in the workhouse. Um, we left Ireland when I was about three and moved to the north of Scotland and we stayed there till I was 14 and we emigrated to Australia. So that's why I've got an Aussie twang. G'day, mate. <laughs> I did the usual things, go through school. And then I did the unusual thing that I wanted to be a speedway racer. The two-wheeled, 500cc, two-wheeled racer. My parents, of course, said, you are not going speedway racing. So I 
said, I'll go car racing instead. They're much safer. They've got twice as many wheels. And um, I then looked at how I could go racing because I had no money. So I worked out that if I could put enough money together, I could go racing under higher purchase. HP in Australia in those days, you had to have 25% as the down payment. I, I found an old Ford for next to nothing, and then I took all the good bits out of one Ford and put them in another. What's, uh, what have I done wrong? Sorry, mate, something's drooping here. It's not you. Let me just adjust this so it doesn't get too small. Have I got a bad attack of the droops? <laughs> <laughs> so I managed to get enough money from bits and pieces. And uh, I said to the car yard, with this amount of money at 25%, what can I get? And he said, you can get that black MGA, but it's got a slipping clutch, but I'll give you a clutch. So that's how I managed to start racing. Got a picture of him there? No. I was an undergraduate and had even less money <laughs> than I had before. So I decided I wanted to be a doctor and I went to England to sit the exams in England which gave me British qualifications. Because in those days, 1966, the um, the, um, this happens every so often a word will disappear you notice that anybody over 50 words disappear they do come back they take about 10 to 15 minutes and all of a sudden bingo there it is anyway I sat the exams in London and I have to say that the POMs, Australian word for English people, but the POMs do it really well. At the end of the week of exams, we were herded into the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. And we had to stand there and wait for our number to be called. There were no names. So when it was my turn, you go up and there's a fellow with a cushion with a ceremonial mace on it. And uh, he asks, what is your number? And I told him my number. And at that point, there was a, a behind him was the, the uh, that's another one that's disappeared, it'll come back. So he said to me, congratulations, sir, to your left. So I moved to my left and there was a corridor, that's the word I was looking for. There was a corridor leading to an another area and there were all my examiners, all to say, congratulations, you are now a doctor. If you didn't pass, when you got to the corridor, you had to turn to the right, and the corridor led you off onto the street. There was, in the, uh, <laughs> those who passed, a big thick book 
yay thick at least, with all the famous doctors, like Hunter and Lister and all these guys. They, this was from going there to England, which was a foreign country for me, to being a doctor. So I graduated in 1966. Get your things out and you work it out. The, um, the way it works, you passed your exams, you're a doctor, you get a silver star, but you are not allowed to deal with or prescribe anything for six months for medicine and another six months for surgery. This is to make sure that you work under supervision. And uh, I said, where do, where do I go? And I was told, go to Devon. It's the British it is the British Riviera. Many of you, or any of you, gone to to Devon? Yeah. And is it really the Riviera? <laughs> well, I know it's not Devon. Cold. So after my six months of working under supervision, I then had to go back to the, to the organisers of it all and say, OK, that was too cold. I spent too many years in Australia. Get me somewhere warm. I said, well, you can have Bermuda or Gibraltar. I said, wow, that sounds great. I'll have Bermuda. They said, no, you won't. If you want to uh, go to Bermuda, you put your name on the list as you do Medicine One. So it takes you six years to get to the top in uh, Bermuda. So I said, OK, what, what about Gibraltar? They said, yes. And it's English speaking and he British protectorate. And great. So I drove to, to Gibraltar from London. The political situation was such that one was stopped at every checkpoint to see where you were going and why. And we got close to Gibraltar and I was told yeah, the border is closed you can't get to Gibraltar from here I said okay so a little town called Marbella I went to the pub and I said does anybody here speak English and uh, a little man at the front said yes I can why? And I said, well, I want to go to Gibraltar. And uh, if the barrier is a wooden stick, same as it is everywhere else, I'll just drive through. And he said, that's an interesting idea. But uh, it is 12 foot high, it is 24 foot wide, etc., etc., and it is locked, and these are the keys, because I am the guardian of the border gate. So I had to put the car on a ferry, take it to Tangiers, then go from Tangiers to Gibraltar. But I did it, did my six months of pre-registration as a surgeon to at least get to the stage where I could 
do minor operations. I wouldn't like to have been my first. Uh, let's, let's talk about my first major operation. And that was from a, a Russian seaman who had appendicitis. And I rang my boss and said, I've got a Russian here with appendicitis. He's going to require an operation. Uh, would you like to come and I'll assist? He said, no. He said, you do it. And if the worst comes to the worst, he will assist. So that was my first, was this Russian seaman. I suppose we'd got him back in the ward about two hours later. And I got a phone call from the nurse say, can you come down here and see the, your patient? And I was immediately, why, what's, what's, what's wrong? They had just come down and see him. So I ran all the way to the, so I thought something awful has happened. The wounds burst open or something. I got to the ward and there is my Russian seaman, fully dressed, in his uniform, standing to attention at the foot of his bed <laughs> and saluting me. The, he stayed by bribing him with vodka. And that was my first operation. I went from there back to the UK and the British Medical Journal has that'll come back the British Medical Journal has the adverts for young doctors to be a locum and uh, there was one advertised in Amersham Anybody know Amersham, the country town? Nice place. The, as I w walked in, a nice driveway, the um, patient, I, I thought was a patient, was walking out. And it turned out that he was the doctor who was leaving. And he said, they're desperate. Hit them high. I said, oh, OK. I went in for my interview. And this interview was nice until they said, what range of emoluments are you looking for? The uh, word emoluments, you never <laughs> use that. But they did. And uh, I said, I figure I forget now how much it was. And they said, so and so pounds. Yes, that should be all right. I said, no, 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 guineas. <laughs> and they said, yes. So I then went to work as a locum in Amersham. And the doctor I was standing in for was a Dr. Bradley Moore. And I said to the staff, I said, where is Dr. Bradley Moore? They said, oh, don't you know? I said, no, I don't know. Dr. Bradley Moore was murdered by one of the patients, and we all knew it. Who? So I would, Thursday morning, I would have to visit him. I would take my stethoscope and waggle it round the door. It's doctor. <laughs> so I managed to sort of get through him. Whilst in Amersham, I saw this beautiful Ferrari go through. And I said, who owns that? They said, oh, that's Earl Howe. 
Now, Earl Howe was a famous name in motor racing. So I went round to his palatial place, rang the bell, the Jeeves appeared, and yes, sir, what is, the, what is it that you want? He said, I'd like to speak to the Earl. He said, have you got an appointment? He said, no, I don't have an appointment. But I, he came back and said, the Earl said he will see you next Tuesday at two o'clock. So two o'clock, spot on, I was there. And the Earl was a really lovely chap. And he said, you're thinking of my father. He is the one who was the famous motor racer. But I've kept one room as his room. And it had all the trophies and all that sort of thing. And then he said, there's a race meeting at Silverstone at the weekend. Would you like to come with us? Would I? Oh, yes. Yes. So came the weekend and the Earl had his mate. Now his mate was driving a thing that looked like an SS100 Jaguar worth millions. And he said, oh no, 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 that I keep the Jag undercover. But this one, I bought a new Jaguar and had a replica body made so that I could drive it on the roads. The rich in the UK, and I don't see any of you here, <laughs> the rich really old money. While I was there, his daughter, the Honourable Sally Curzon. Goodbye, Daddy. I'm off to Monaco for the Grand Prix. And she married Piers Courage, who's son of Courage Breweries. So there's really big, strong money, which I didn't have. I needed to get back to Australia because I wanted to build a racing car. And I got um, a position with the Blue Star port line as the ship surgeon. I said, okay, that'll do. Went on board, signed on, and the captain said, you do realize that you are the dentist as well. I said, no. He said, yes, you are the dentist as well. I said, okay, not a problem, because I had seen a dental surgery just down the road. So I raced in there, and the dentist came out and said, you've just found out that you're the dentist, haven't you? I said, yes, I only just found out he says, all right, I'll show you a 10-minute dentistry course. These are the pliers that you will use. You rock it round, you turn it down, then you pull. He said, and that's it. And he said, you will only do one on the voyage. He said, how do you know that? It's because you will do it so badly, no one will come near you. got back to Australia and started building the car. That one. Even the grill was handmade by these hands. It was called Super B and British Leyland offered me a goodly sum to run it under British Island colours. 
which were blue and white. Super B, the, um, it, it is remembered in Australia because it was just so quick. They eventually banned it from racing because they said it's just too fast for the class. And uh, while I was counting the money, was a substantial sum and I got a, I got a, from British Leyland the words that this was the fastest MGB in the world and wasn't bad for a young doctor We're now about 1970. How am I going for time? Right. I got my first taste of Asia, Southeast Asia in particular, in 1972. And a friend of mine who was an engineer Ivan Tai, dead now. We went to the Philippines, Hong Kong, Macau, Thailand and Malaysia. Macau was interesting because the PR chap was a fellow by the name of Ronnie Poo. <coughs> and I had rung Ronnie from Australia say, I want to go to the Macau Grand Prix. And he said, you crazy? Cannot, cannot. All booked out. I said, oh, okay. And then he said, all right, what hotel you stay? Told him. And he arranged for a couple of the air hostesses to look after me at the Malaysian Grand Prix. I was still taken so much by cars. I built and designed my own Ford Escort which was all space frame, fiberglass, it weighed 600 kilograms, and it was the fastest Ford Escort in Australia as well. When I was keeping my surgery going, I had a call one night from the locum who was sort of looking after my practice at night, say, oh, we've got a patient gone mad. Can you come? I said, no. You're the one who's supposed to be looking after it. He said, I can't, it's too much. So I drove around and it was, this fella had decided that he was Jesus. And uh, he's walking around this block saying that he was Jesus. So I saw him and I said, look, why don't we go to the hospital? Because I know that there are people there, souls that need salvation. And I almost got him into the car, but not quite. 
he became quite manic again. And I said, right, what we have to do is the locum doctor has the syringe. I am the one to get him to stop in one place. The police came and we were all set at the word we jumped on him. Now, people when they go manic develop incredible power and he was, he was just so strong, it was crazy. And we were wrestling on the ground. I looked over and the policeman was there and there was the insignia of the Queensland Police with the words firmness with courtesy <laughs> as, as they're beating the buggery out of him. I had I had by this stage seen and were part of or inside of various devices. I was in a fire twice, roll over twice, a helicopter, an LCAC. Anybody know what an LCAC is? No? That's a landing craft air cushion. One of those air cushion um, things. And they're American. A light plane, a tiger moth, a micro line, a sail plane glider, a hot air balloon, and a parachute jump, and a speedway motorcycle. Uh, don't doctors do this? Well, my father was most upset when he found out that I was racing. And he said, son, doctors don't do those things. I said, sorry, Dad, this doctor does. Well, I went out and I won that race and my father immediately elevated himself to team manager. <laughs> so unfortunately, he died very early. In fact, I am the oldest male in my family. Um, Dad was 56 when he died. Um, huge loss. I could dribble on forever about race cars. They are just so much part of my life and uh, were continuing to be part of my life till last November. I had noticed that I was getting slower and slower until I was holding people up and I thought that's not what motor racing is about. So I officially retired in December last year. That was the end of my racing career. But if someone offers me a drive, I wouldn't mind having another little fang. Uh, now,
Okay. There it is, Super B, the world's fastest MGB. The Formula Ford, they won the Australian Championship with that car. That's a Formula One of 1990. And that was probably my, if you put it any quite closer, I'll be eating it. That would have been 1990, the Formula 5000. The Gemini, and oh, the Datsun, that surface paradise, Martyr Private Hospital. That's another Ford. That's me. That's here, that's at Bain Sen. Where the pizza company approached me and I said, we'll give you a car to race. Yeah. Is it the last one? I don't know. That's one that fell over, it tripped in Thailand. In Thailand. That's me back in the... And here you are, overworked, job suck, unappreciated, family problems, money worries. Well, here is the pill for you. Fuck it all. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. Okay, thank you. Paper? Would you like to sit down and take a few questions in the prone position? Okay. No, he's happy to take questions. So. Uh, what was your top speed? Top speed isn't important in a race car because the top speed you can attain depends upon how long the, the main straight is. But the Formula One car, I did 300 kilometers an hour in that. One on, on your left, Doctor. Yeah, thanks very much, Doctor. Very interesting talk. I thought we might get onto the wine, but we never got onto it. <laughs> I'm, I was told about, well over 10 years ago that I should contact you to go around the Bira circuit with my car. Is this still possible, or would you still be able to see the corners? Are we both too old for this now? Um, but what is the uh, what is the way if I want to take my car around the Beera circuit? You actually have to approach be the Beera circuit management because they rent out the circuit, the actual driving. So, so I was told you take your own car, but perhaps this is not right. Um, it used to be, but now there are so many rich Thai guys with Ferraris and four Porsches and everything. Unless you have something totally exotic, don't worry. No, no not quite as, as exotic as those cars at any rate. Thank you, I might contact them and, and have a drive around the, the circuit with one of their cars in here. Got one over here in the center. Ian, thank you for the talk, it was wonderful. As a Kiwi, did you ever come across Bruce McLaren? Have it anything to do with him? No, I know who you mean. Mm. He but was a... It depends upon the class that you're running in. While I was running in Formula One class, uh, it would have been a thing that I could have seen, met McLaren before he got killed. Yes. Um, so. 
even for those of us in New Zealand who knew nothing about cars or had any interest whatever in motor racing. He was an absolute household name, as you can appreciate, for many, many decades. Yes. Yeah, mm. a, a very nice guy. Fabulous, fabulous guy, yeah. Thank you. I would just like to ask how you came to work for Bangkok Retire Hospital and how long ago that was. I've been in Pattaya 23 years. I think I've been in the hospital 15, 18 years, somewhere around about there. How long have you been writing for these, the team here? For the 15 to 18 years. <laughs> a bloke who said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And he said, I'll take you to a bloke. And he took me to see Peter Mohotra. And uh, Peter said, what can you do? I said, well, I could do a motoring column. And I'll never forget his words when he said, do I really need one? So, have you actually written? You've written on a lot of different subjects. Well, let me start in 1966 when I was in Gibraltar. The Australian Woman's Weekly had a competition on about how they were dealing with expat life, etc. And the wife of the day said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, all right, I will. So I wrote a column for the Australian Women's Weekly. Under your name or a woman's name? Under her name. But it was, it was worth $500. That was big money in 1966. And I thought, I like this, so I've been writing ever since including two books. So if you haven't got one of my books, I think Asia books have. What, what, are, what, are, what, are, what are the two books? What are they called? What are they? Farang. <laughs> Farang. Farang and Farang in Thailand. Mm. Did he pay me well? Did he pay you at all? <laughs> <laughs> a huge round of applause for a very charming talk. And uh, I was going to say something nice about him, but the word's gone. We come back, back in about 15 minutes. Wow, fantastic life, fantastic, charming talk, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was a very witty talk too. If I go here, I might be okay. Don't know. I'll try it here. Thanks again, doctor.